Um, so now we are at the end of the panel. Uh, we heard some very interesting, um, uh, we heard from the, our very, very interesting um, uh, discussions and arguments and um, uh, we heard from um, uh, the developed countries, from New York City, we heard comparative um, examples from Western Europe, we heard more from the developing, did I say developing? developed countries. We heard from the developing countries, from New Delhi and uh, from Istanbul. We heard many different issues such as the importance of proximity, accessibility, correlation of per capita income and car ownership, the importance of financing, technology. We heard about many different concepts, the importance of transparency, accountability, governance, um, and most importantly, I believe we heard about the importance of political ownership of brave decision makers, as you uh, pointed out. Now, since our uh, session is focusing on climate change and transport, I would like to also point out that we heard about the difference of how developed countries tackle the issues of GHG management and uh, CO2 emissions and how the difference of how developing countries tackle the issues. We heard that there are no clear CO2 targets in um, transport policy making and in the decision making process. Um, and we also heard that there are serious um, challenges in um, GHG inventories, in measuring GHG, in, C in measurement of CO2 emissions. Now when we look at uh, some of the ratios, we see that um, transport originating CO2 emissions per capita, when you compare it, uh, let's say, between the U.S. and in the USA, it's about four tons per person. When you look at Europe, it's about two tons per person. When you look at a country such as China, it's 0 0.5. India, it's much lower than 0 0.5. Turkey has no uh, estimates um, clearly uh, publici public public publicized. Public published, published. However, the estimates that we have made as REC show that it's above one ton, so about one and a half in fact, but it's, um, it's difficult to justify these numbers. So uh, there is a clear distinct, uh, d uh, distinction between um, developed and developing countries. However, according to the COP15, the negotiations are progressing in such a way that developing countries will also have to have clear targets. So now I give the floor to Philip Rhodes, who will start the discussions on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Isabel. Yeah, we come to the second half, and uh, we're going to have a good 40 minutes for the discussion. So unlike yesterday, I have asked our discussants to be very quick with a first reflection on what they have just heard, bringing in their own experience, and then hopefully we'll have more time to go around the table several times. So our first uh, uh, reflector or uh, respondent here is Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev is the president of the Sustainable Planet Institute from Delhi. Sanjeev. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to say will have a somewhat of a developing country perspective, but it is uh, equally applicable to uh, developed countries. Uh, as you know, uh, developing countries have the bulk of the urban population of the world, but even more so, going forward, virtually all the future urbanization will happen in developing countries. Uh, India alone will add 350 to 400 million people to its urban spaces in the next 30 years. Uh, what is interesting about this, of course, is that these urban spaces do not exist at this point in time. So that we have uh, an opportunity here to really uh, guide the way this happens. And in this context, uh, I was particularly happy to hear what Jeanette has to talk about uh, non-motorized transport, particularly walkability. Here is the most advanced city in the world, uh, essentially talking about uh, creating non-motorized forms of transport. And it's critical for us to understand this because we are still building cities in the developing world with essentially the car in mind. I live in Gurgaon, which is a brand new city. It went from wheat fields to a population of 3.5 million in 10 years' time. And Essentially, there's not even one square meter of sidewalks in that city. It's entirely based on some form of car transport. It doesn't mean people don't walk, but they walk on the side of the road, get killed, etc., etc. So this is a very, very important uh, issue. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that 
people in developing countries do not already walk. In fact, uh, when you talk about public transport, walkability is by far the most important form of public transport. Just give you some statistics. In Bombay, which is probably the worst place in the world to walk, 56% or thereabouts of the population walks the entire way for most of their journeys. Of the rest, another 40% uses public transport, which of course means that the last mile or the first mile is also walked. So well over 90% of the population is walking part or all of their uh, journey. And yet, whenever I bring up this point, everybody pats me on the back and begins discussing buses and trams and taxis. Clearly, buses and trains are important, but there is no doubt in my mind that walkability and its sister form, cycling, is by far the more impo most important form of public transport. This is where the focus has got to be. Now, when we are talking about developing countries, as I mentioned, an important aspect of this is the fact that these urban spaces do not exist. And this is important because urban form has a very important bearing on how walkability in particular works. Because we do not have the urban form, we can create the kinds of density and uh, urban forms that work for walkability. Again, as I said, whenever I bring up these topics, uh, I'm patterned on the back, the debate then moves on to buses. I'm nothing against what Geetam has to say, but from what I had to see from her presentation, the best thing about her, uh, her project is the fact that it gave so much uh, um, emphasis on cycling and walking on the side. The fact that it improved the uh, uh, speed of buses is an uh, interesting side effect as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. <laughs> we are moving to our second uh, discussant. Uh, that's uh, Dimitri Sengeli. He is the chief climate economist at Cisco. And he is also a visiting tutor at the London School of Economics at the recently established Grantham Institute for Climate Change. Thank you, Philip. Um, I, you, you asked before that I should outline some of the areas that, time, that Cisco are involved in, uh, in terms of uh, urban sustainability, and, I, and I'll do that. But I, I just thought, following yesterday's interesting discussion, that I might try and tie in some of that uh, discussion into the present uh, 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 session we're having on, on climate change. And you know, it struck me that you know, we're all familiar with the fact that cities are the engines of growth. Uh, they are uh, uh, centers of dynamism and creativity, but what is it that makes them unique? And as you say, what is it that puts them in the position uh, to be part of the solution, as you, you said in your introduction? And I think uh, cities have certain unique ingredients, apart from taking account of more and more of the world's population. Uh, they also offer a unique blend of diversity and specialization, uh, which allows for a pool of talents that can operate together and at scale very, very quickly. And this uh, environment is one that breeds su successful innovation, not just uh, research and development, but all the way through to demonstration and commercialization. You need that mix of talents uh, and creativity, and you need the scale and density with which to do that. Uh, and I'm talking here not just innovation in technology, in widgets and machines and, and the kinds of things you and I normally think about, but also innovation in rules, in policies, in institutions, and as was mentioned before, in governance, good governance. Because uh, I think that's central. Uh, to understanding how you can bring about a successful city, both in terms of sustainability uh, and, of course, uh, in, in other criteria. And then cities can compete and learn from best practice. So a model that works in one city can be applied elsewhere. It might be totally useless in a third city. Uh, but you have this urban competition and these, these, these frameworks that can, be applied, uh, that can be applied more generally. But it requires good governance. It requires leadership from mayors, from regional governments, and also partnership, I think, uh, with national governments. It's very difficult for a city to work alone without a lead uh, at the national or at the state level. And if that governance is credible and sends out a long-term signal to businesses, uh, then they will innovate and they will invest if they feel that markets uh, exist into the medium uh, and, uh, and, and long term. Um, the option to take a dirty route to development, which may have applied to some uh, heavy industrial trade oriented export oriented development paths for some cities in the past is going to become less and less viable uh, as we go forward. Uh, the reason being that the world is going to become carbon constrained uh, and massive new markets and opportunities are going to avail themselves there. 
uh, and those uh, cities, those countries, those companies uh, that try and avoid adjusting uh, to that inevitable change are going to lose out on the ability to take advantage of new markets, to set technologies, to establish institutions, uh, and to be able to profit from uh, what is ultimately a very large opportunity. Cisco is one company that, that clearly does see huge opportunities here. Uh, on the transport area, it's investing very heavily in travel substitution, collaborative tools, videos, uh, smart workstations where you don't have to go into the office, but you can go into a local business center type area. Personal transit assistants that allow you to have a real-time mapping of what's going on in your local area, how you can connect buses to, uh, to trains and, and so on. Um, Eco-mapping. Uh, full earth observation, uh, down to nano sensory, allowing things to be smarter. Dumb machines can start operating just in time. Smart building, smart distribution network, smart generation, etc. Um, things can be a lot more efficient if they operate uh, uh, in a coordinated manner. So anything with the word smart in it has a role for a company like Cisco. But it's also energy intensive companies that are moving. That's why we're seeing Honda and Shell and Toyota and, and, and uh, GE. These companies make their money out of being energy and currently carbon intensive. And they see that they will be, you know, their markets will be wiped out the way the world is going. So they're investing incredibly heavily in low carbon, uh, in low carbon technologies and low carbon innovations. And so I think cities and governments uh, can learn from the way business is going, at least from the way uh, smart business, forward-looking business is going and setting out the right policy frameworks and the right uh, governance institutions to try and make for le more resource, uh, less resource-intensive, more sustainable, uh, and more livable uh, urban environments. Thank you very much. I think th th that's a crucial point, what you said about, uh, in a way, enabling sustainable po sustainability policy means enabling the city as such and links it directly back to the overall agenda of the urban age. Let's move to our next uh, discussant, Hilma von Lejewski. Hilma is a program manager of GTZ, uh, the German technical corporation in Damascus. Thank you, Philip. Uh, some rather personal observations, and I would like to link them to some stages of uh, development. I think we have left the cynical stage also in Syria on climate change, the cynical stage which says, well, we are in the Damascus Valley at 700 meter height. We have observed that our harbor, our entry ports in Syria are prone to the water. We have observed that drought drives thousands of people into the cities uh, where we do not cope with their resettlement. We are in the analytical stage for sure, and um, the uh, analytical stage, as we have observed here also today, is quite clear. What we haven't probably analyzed sufficiently is yet the psychological dimension of uh, how to use individual car traffic, uh, uh, individual traffic, and how to use energy consuming devices. I'm focusing in the Middle East primarily on uh, the role car, a car plays in social recognition and uh, the mechanisms, how it comes that um, the rate of uh, the car sales in this region exceeds any other or many other regions uh, in uh, Europe, uh, well, differs not much from China. And the role, which is, might be a minor issue, the role of the AC in society. The AC is not being turned off anymore in Syria in middle-class households and offices of the government. The AC runs six months for cooling and six months for heating, I have the impression, and maybe it might be uh, worth to explore a little bit more on um, the status symbol of ACs and cars, um, because they have a tremendous impact on energy consumption. I'm quite optimistic uh, on the other hand, about uh, the analytical findings um, which we have experienced here today. Uh, but I'm, uh, again, very pessimistic um, about um, the um, policy development of countries like Syria, because I cannot observe that any action is taken, taken to strengthen, for example, pedestrians. Maybe we are still in the cynical stage, how we treat pedestrians throughout this region, and um, observing 
um, in my own day-to-day -day moves in a city like Damascus, um, how thousands of pedestrians are drawn up um, very um, uh, fragile staircases to cross uh, an eight-lane street, which is absolutely useless, and then being drawn down again, then um, uh, I believe that um, the recognition of the pedestrian um, as the solution to individual traffic in the city is uh, still a long way to go. Maybe Urban Age should take up or gather its uh, joint efforts to ask for a year of the pedestrians uh, launched by the United Nations. When I look at my individual behavior, I'm also quite pessimistic because I'm one of these persons who switches between SUV and folding bicycle. Uh, maybe uh, there is a reason to be optimistic in behavioral change because uh, the last week I have been called twice by Porsche Cayenne drivers uh, in Damascus asking where I got my folding bike from. Uh, first looking at me like an alien and then asking where I got my folding bike from. So maybe behavioral change is a chance uh, even um, in a society where car plays such a great role. Um, to come to an end, I think um, I'm, I'm very proud of what my uh, profession, the planners, the traffic planners, um, are able to provide in terms of analytical uh, knowledge and power. I'm again quite pessimistic about um, the politicians taking it up and uh, bringing it to decisions. So living in a country like Syria, which, uh, frankly spoken, I would regard as a kind of guided democracy, I, would, I see a chance as a planner for top-down decisions only. As long as these decisions are not taking top-down what mean of transport to use and making uh, offers um, to the, uh, the um, users of the city which are not um, uh, somewhat escapable, which we have to use, Unless this is not uh, done, I'm um, pessimistic about the changes um, in uh, traffic in um, uh, cities um, uh, like Damascus or uh, any other um, larger cities throughout the world. I haven't explored yet on settlement patterns, which might be worth to do in the uh, discussion to come, but I focus now on traffic only as a, for me, most decisive trigger for um, emission reduction in uh, agglomerations. Thank you, Hemar. <clears throat> Our next uh, speaker is Semi Eri Yildiz. He's a professor of architecture and urbanization at Istanbul Aydin University. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, very interesting ideas and proposals. Um, as a Turkish panelist, um, Nowadays, I'm uh, just working on um, uh, Hadith plan to give a green light to Hadith plan or greenize it a little bit. And also, uh, I thank uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Bercek, is one of the best choice about our uh, transport policy in Istanbul. And just um, um, generally, might be, uh, we had um, different uh, differences of ideas, beliefs, and observations. Very hard about the success stories, about the essence, about the city, about the mobility. Uh, we believe eco-cities sustaining water, energy, food inside the city for all the inhabitants. As planners and designers, we should design, plan, decide, behave. Cities to be able to sustain uh, People should be uh, deciding as workers and farmers, city farmers, and uh, we should think and behave eco or logic of eco, natural, aesthetic, ethic, bioclimatic. And then, um, but we should leave these differences and about uh, practical uh, ideas. Um, uh, First, uh, I, I try to, um, in a way, um, give a proposal, um, create for Istanbul, we need uh, one single agency, Marmara Authority, 
might be lo like London Transport Authority and a, a little bit more, to act, to enact, to behave, find and spend money on his plans and programs. This is the first. And about, um, uh, we all um, oppose against the third bridge. Uh, it is not just opposition. We have um, many proposals. Um, one I have uh, written 15 years ago in Architect, one of the Turkish oldest ar uh, uh, architectural magazine. Uh, we can double one of the, uh, make it duplex one of our bridges, as in New York in Second World War. And uh, might be, um, we can uh, put some ferry stations to Silivri and Pendik and make free passage for uh, uh, our uh, transpassing people. You know, there was two emperors, their idea was uh, going Baudak to Berlin. They are not existing, but their ideas are going to be realized now in 14. But uh, they will go from uh, Baudak to Berlin uh, without passing, without uh, crossing any or our soil, but in, uh, in order to go uh, from my place to Nishantashi, to my home, to Kartal, I will make uh, three shifts in this transport system if it's going to be finalized. There should be some solutions for this. And also, um, uh, we have, uh, you mentioned about electrical cars. And, um, uh, no hybrid cars. Today, Turkish uh, car industry announced uh, fully electric cars. They are going to produce 10,000, but they are going to export. Uh, I offer um, uh, to ban this export and to use it in Istanbul. And also, um, uh, they, uh, they say uh, it's, they are using um, energy from the uh, um, a kind of uh, non-sustainable uh, sources, but uh, it, it can be designed in their cover, in their uh, houses. They, they can uh, sustain all their uh, energy in, on their owner's residences, and all oil stations must be obliged to recharge spare batteries. We designed as architects uh, interesting um, oil stations with uh, flags or um, very um, interesting design uh, for all um, uh, oil stations. And also, um, uh, we could uh, limit, as in many countries, uh, our bridges will um, charge uh, 20 arrows if they will pass one, and if they will pass uh, five, they will uh, charge two euros. It's very simple. Uh, it's, we are saying to you, but uh, to make more advice, to take more advice, might be more interesting um, advices like this. And um, we talk about cycling and walking, as they mentioned. Uh, if you try to uh, walk or cycle in Istanbul now, it's a kind of co uh, committing suicide, euthanasy. You cannot. Uh, but it's possible. It, we need uh, to transport our cycles or uh, electrical cycles in future uh, to transport to higher, um, to the uh, tops of our uh, city or from one place, uh, water, uh, by boat to the others, something like that. We need more uh, creative ideas like Milan um, um, or the other examples. Um, if uh, there will be time, then we, these, those are the, our um, common points. But uh, if we will have time, we will um, talk about our contradictions, about the idea of city, idea of mobility, and idea of um, uh, sensing human and nature and being, create, create, creation. Thank okay? you.
L last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Sonia Francine Gaspar Maramo, from, uh, who is the uh, sub-mayor of the Lapa district in Sao Paulo. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's very good to be reminded how we politicians, policymakers, decision makers have to be brave to fight a lot of resistance, uh, habits, behavior. Um, like in, in Brazil, one of the main measures the government took to fight the economical crisis was cutting federal taxes on cars so that we could sell more cars and we could have less unemployment. So th there, there's a lot to, uh, to fight. And although it is quite dangerous to say so, one of the drawbacks of democracy is that the majority could well be wrong. Like we were told yesterday, uh, people are very concerned about congestion, about the traffic, but 80% of the non car owners would like to own one, <laughs> would, would own a car if they could. So sometimes really we have to, to fight uh, the majority, <laughs> maybe, and that's very hard on politicians because everyone is a specialist. <laughs> everyone thinks the way we know the best way to use the street we, we live in. So there's, there's a lot to fight and one of the Probably one of the best ways to fight that is, is to take rapid action. If you can find some very quick, easy uh, measures that show the results in, in, the, in the short run, then you can easily fight resistance because you can please both the utilitarian minds by showing them that you can reduce traveling time and emissions. Um, and also the dreamers' minds <laughs> who can believe that uh, change can really be, be performed. But um, I think we haven't put enough emphasis on one point we all agree. Uh, let me uh, quote you <laughs> things that have been said today, like this, this lack of integration of land use and transportation, the need for proximity, we need uh, to talk about settlement patterns. We need to reduce travel demands. And I think that's a point we haven't uh, discussed enough. Like in Sao Paulo, the, the east part of Sao Paulo, which is very big, uh, like the, the farthest point is 30 kilometers far from the city center and I'm talking about the city itself, not the metropolitan area. Um, so in, in the east part of Sao Paulo, live, we have a population of three million people, which is more or less the population of Uruguay. And every day, 2.5 million people travel towards the city center in the morning <laughs> and back in the afternoon to work because the city is still sprawling, the population is growing in the extremities, but not the economical activity, not, not the jobs, they're not moving further from the center, so people still have to move every day uh, to travel very far to, to the center and then, and then back home. So we, we know that that's, that's a problem. There's no way you can really um, provide with uh, comfortable, predictable transportation for that many people, for 2.5 million, going in the same direction at the same time. So our subway is uh, overcrowded, the trains, the highways, the buses, they're all overloaded. And uh, unless we pile subway lines, <laughs> we will never make it. So we have to reduce the need for, for those many, many travels. And we all know that one of the answers for that for, uh, and for walkability, uh, et cetera, is the mixed use of, of city soil, the, the, the uh, providing with many different things at, at one same place. So we all agree on that, but we haven't really come to discuss how to do that, how government can do that, how, how the private sector should do that uh, with the um, 
being pressed by or with incentives from, from the government. We have, these, we have many creative solutions, bus lanes, cycle lanes, pedestrian lanes, but how to promote the mixed use of the, of the urban soil. So some things strike me as being very simple, but we don't do them. Like when you have these mass housing projects, well, at some time ago in Sao Paulo, you just build 400,000 units in the middle of nowhere. And nowadays, fortunately, we have <laughs> realized that you have to provide schooling and health service, etc. But still, we're not providing with uh, space for commerce and services. So why not? And then people who live in these huge mass projects, um, we, we press them, we, we push, we, sorry, we push them into uh, informality. They buy from street vendors, they become street vendors, and far from where they live, like in the city center. So why, why that, that seems to me quite easy to do when the government builds, builds this huge uh, mass housing projects, why not provide with the area, with the possibility of offering jobs and services and commerce where, where people live. So that could start by to reduce the number of, of travels, of, of traveling demand. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. I would, I would like to open the discussion by, with a brief res reference to yesterday. I think we had a very enlightened uh, talk by Soketo Meta about storytelling and particular kinds of storytelling. And I think what we heard about walkability, what we heard about mixed use and proximity, just goes unfortunately pretty much against the storytelling, the classic narrative about the globalizing, the progression of the big city. Uh, where I'd say the classic narrative is much more about bridges like the one behind me. It's about the massive infrastructure projects we have seen. And uh, I would like to use uh, the, the reference to walking in particular, because it's such a humble means of transport, to ask uh, Jeanette the following question, because in a way she uh, introduced the very enlightened strategy for New York City. If I'm right, I got uh, the statistics also, thanks to uh, Halo Gercek, the total percentage of people walking in the city is about 50%. But the budget spent on walking and cycling together over the last 10 years in this city has been 2%. There's a very clear bias towards the long distance, towards the motorized mobility. And we are discriminating proximity and slow transport. Well, as an economist would probably point out, uh, you have to do this because to uh, take advantage of a large agglomeration, you need to have access across space. So I just wondered in New York City, which of course has a very established transit network and offers the distant mobility already, how is this discourse at the moment seen where you talk about investments for slow transport, slow movement, reinforcing proximity versus the big narrative on the global city? Well, I think it's important to understand that the, the, that the residents of New York City spent about two years uh, coming together around uh, roundtables like this, talking about what they want the future of New York City to be like. And in 25 years, when they walk out their door, are they going to like what they see? And so that led to the Plan YC sustainability agenda, which is widely bought into uh, by uh, New Yorkers. And so that really set the table in a very different way. It's really important, I believe, that you have a game plan going forward that the public buys into, and that allows you to move forward with different kinds of strategies that might not be as politically acceptable uh, as one might think. I have to underscore that walking and biking are not expensive investments to make. Um, even the transformation that we did on Broadway only cost $1.5 million. Um, you can outline a city, you can outline what a future uh, uh, of the city can look like. You can, you know, take that approach um, in any of the developed or developing uh, countries. And so, again, it's really repurposing uh, the existing infrastructure that's there. It's making a bold decision like Mayor Bloomberg has done to say, we're going to use uh, the real estate of our streets differently. We're going to build in public transit, we're going to build in mass transit, we're going to build in a dedicated cycling system, and we're going to build a city uh, for walking. And it's, it's dollars and cents, it's not just window dressing. What we've seen is that property values, retail values, commercial values uh, go dramatically up uh, when you've got quality 
uh, public space and when you create uh, an attractive public realm. Thank you. Let me pass over to Haluk to respond. Well, in, in Istanbul, as I tried to explain, the walking share of the total trips is about 50%, which is, it seems great amount of for people walking. But I think this is due to mainly two reasons. First of all, uh, mostly uh, people try to avoid um, their choosing their destination that they cannot walk because they get stuck, stuck in the traffic. For, I, I know from my own experience that uh, if I have a choices to make a trip, I would prefer destination location within my walking distance because I know if I go into my car or in a public transit, I will get in the, stuck in the traffic for minutes and minutes. So this is one reason. The other reason, which could be a good one, is that the city is growing in a polycentric way and then you can find a lot of uh, location that within your walking distance and you prefer walking rather than getting on the motor vehicle traffic. Um, but uh, if you look at the conditions of the sidewalks and the walking facilities, it is not great, we know that. I mean, you sometimes put your life in danger when you try from uh, going A to B in, a, in any location in the city because city is more or less designed for the vehicles. And for cycling, I, I think there, there, there's a, there are rumors about the cycling network of about 100, uh, 1,000 kilometers in the city for 2020s, but there's no uh, clear uh, decision about how to implement it. It's just on the paper. So uh, cycling, uh, it's totally uh, out of uh, you know, uh, focus here. So I would say that um, we, the, the policymakers should focus on this non-motorized tra uh, transport here in the city uh, to increase the uh, potential for walking and cycling. Thank you. Another point I picked up from Hilma, I think, is this general uh, view on lifestyle change. And Gitam already highlighted that technology alone is not going to do it. And I think your example of the SUV driver asking for the folding bike is a very intriguing one. And uh, maybe, Gitam, you want to reflect on the, the notion of an emerging middle class in India eager to, in a way, get into the more traditional mode of material consumption and whether you see at all opportunities of the leapfrogging towards the more green technology and the more green behavior. A difficult question, but uh, let me, in fact, I could answer this by sharing my experience with you since 1996 when the first plan was prepared for Delhi government. It was called the Bicycle Master Plan for Delhi. And it was in 98 suggesting that how streets could be uh, designed differently to create more walkable and bicycle friendly streets and bicycle uh, and bus project was just uh, an offshoot of that. At that time, all policymakers and, in fact, even the experts in the city confronted us with saying that we thought you people were from school, Institute of Technology. Why are you talking about walking and bicycles? <laughs> that was the first thing. Up to 2002, there was no discussion on that. Delhi government, which had funded this project, they shelved it. And only when the same thing we started talking in terms of buses, and we just internally decided the bicycle lanes and the pedestrian paths are there, but let us not discuss it. Because we realized that many of the policy makers and bureaucrats, if you show them a drawing, they cannot understand what's in the drawing. So we just kept talking about buses and improving space for cars because the bicycles won't be there and the pedestrian will not be walking in front of the car and the buses. That's how actually the project got by in by the government, there was no discussion otherwise. And when, during construction, as I suggest, showed you that when they actually realized that how the cars are being affected, this really hostile media reaction started. So that is one, and I, therefore, my answer to your question is that uh, middle class definitely is aspiring to have cars. There is no doubt about it. And I think our policies are 
it's uh, reinforcing that. Because if we keep on building infrastructure which makes it easier for you, for you to use your car, then more people are going to use it. There is enough, and in fact, fortunately, I would say in Indian cities, there are enough people walking and bicycling also because of our settlement patterns, because we already have mixed land use patterns, sometimes by planning and often by defying formal plans. So if that is the case, then actually there is a huge opportunity that we can actually get these potential users and we can convert captive users, people who are using these modes in a very hostile conditions, to become choice users by creating the right kind of infrastructure. But I would say that it is a huge uphill task. Sanjeev, do you see any additional opportunities along that line? Absolutely. Um, having talked so aggressively about walkability, let me add that the case for Bombay is in fact not making the real case. The point is that most of the urban population don't live in these gigantic cities. They actually live in much, much smaller cities where walking is more than feasible. I mean, you don't even have to make those long uh, journeys in most of these cities. So when we are talking about walkability and the urban age, it's not just about the gigantic cities. It is about much smaller cities. Um, and yet, when we build the infrastructure, as Geetam pointed out, we create it almost deliberately subvert walking. I'll give you an example since I talked about Gurgaon, city of 3.5 million. It has the National Highway 8, 10 lanes of it going right through the middle of the city. And in fact, there are exactly five places where you can cross it by foot. Now what happens is that you've now introduced public transport on it using buses. And anybody using the buses once a day is on the wrong side of the road. So then he has to run across 10 lanes. And of course, till they recently uh, blocked the passage, something like, uh, you know, uh, 30, 40 people were getting killed every year crossing this road. So the point is we are almost setting ourselves up for this problem. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, it, it doesn't take much. People do want to walk. Thank you. Um, Dimitri, can I come back to you as the only economist on the table? And I, the, the following question. You have heard a lot about uh, very tangible projects, projects that can happen on the ground to help us with the climate change challenge. At the meeting in Copenhagen, cities are not going to be that prominent. In fact, there are many city leaders that are fighting for a greater voice. But I think there's sort of an agreement you need to get the international frameworks right, particularly the prices, and then the city will sort out itself. How do you reflect as an economist on these more, not top-down, but rather uh, precise ideas on the ground, how change can actually happen, while at the same time, I think, giving uh, flexibility towards the solutions. I think if you reflect on a table like this, one gets a, sort of a bit of a prescriptive uh, idea. There's BRT, there's walking. Uh, I think we do not see at an international level that kind of tangible uh, thinking, which also helps for the general public to engage more in these very broad numbers about 2050. What are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I think you've captured it very well there, Philip. I mean, I, I think you do need to allow cities the flexibility to be innovative, to be creative, to set uh, policy frameworks that are different to other cities or to, to copy best practice uh, in the same way as other cities. Uh, however, it's much harder for cities to have a successful uh, environment with which to tackle uh, climate change and to uh, provide incentives for low-carbon technologies if they don't take a lead uh, from government at the national level. Very often a lot of the rules relating to fiscal policy, taxation, but also standards and regulations uh, come at the government at the state level. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. Uh, it's much easier uh, to implement the kinds of policies we've talked about here in terms of transportation, but also in terms of buildings and uh, uh, in terms of things like uh, uh, combined heat and power and so on, which cities are very well placed to do. Um, it's much easier to do that if there's actually a price for carbon, for example, so that businesses feel that they can make a return, uh, either selling carbon credits or avoiding a carbon tax. It's much easier to do that if, there's a, uh, if there are standards and regulations at the national level um, so that businesses are not only uh, in investing in, in new products and processes for one or two cities, but they're doing it at scale across a country. 
Um, so I think uh, national policy is very important, and then taking it one step further up, national policy only makes sense uh, if it's part of a global collaborative approach. A ton of carbon emitted here in Istanbul is, does the same damage as a, as a, a ton of carbon emitted in, in uh, Innsbruck. It, it doesn't. The, the origin of, of that uh, of that ton of carbon makes no difference. So, if only some countries are acting and others aren't, then it is a valid concern that you know some of your uh, actions will be um, won't be as effective. I won't say wasted because sooner or later all countries will be acting to some degree. So, those that move first uh, may get less bang for their buck in terms of the global uh, contribution, but actually they may uh, steal a march in terms of. Uh, being early movers. So I think you do need a coordinated policy approach at the international level, you need uh, a lead at the national level, but you need cities also to have the flexibility to undertake the kinds of policies that we're talking about. And that does require good leadership and good governance at the city level, but it also requires leadership at the national level as well and collaboration at the global level. All right, well, um, before closing the session, I would like to remind everyone that um, we started the panel by uh, making the comment that cities are highly vulnerable to impacts of climate change. Therefore, when we discuss climate change, we do not only mention mitigation, but of course adaptation. Uh, and this involves uh, transport, especially transport, how to adapt uh, to um, climate change. Uh, we heard of very good examples. Uh, we heard of the differences between developed countries' approaches in developing countries. Um, we heard uh, differences among developed countries. For example, uh, per capita emissions related to transport in the U.S. 